Hi, uh, welcome to today's webinar. I am Hella Schwartz Grossman, Marketing Manager at Waldox. Before we get started with the webinar, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded and the link will be emailed to you afterwards. Everyone is muted right now, but if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the GoToWebinars questions pane and we'll address questions at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar is part of our new legal technology webinar series where we'll introduce some of our partners. Join us on Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Today we would like you to meet Arias. And the topic of today's webinar is information security for law firms, a case study in protecting clients, collaboration, and communication. Law firms have officially become the favorite targets of hackers. Data breaches, ransomware attacks, and other security incidents are on the rise. And clients and vendors are asking about your cybersecurity practices. Attorneys need to communicate, collaborate, and share information to efficiently serve clients. More than ever, law firms are putting technology to work to help them meet that goal. Join today's speakers, Antonella Camiato, Steve Henn, and Aaron Fritz for a discussion on how do you create the right technology ecosystem while maintaining a high level of information privacy and security. Thank you in advance for the attention you'll be giving this webinar today. And Steve, I'm handing it over to you now. Thank you, Hella. So first off, I'd like to thank World Docs for inviting us to participate in this event. And I also want to thank the viewers, both those who are participating today and those who will see it online later. I think we have a very timely discussion today about information security for law firms. And specifically, we will be talking about a case study of an ISO 27001 implementation and the positive effects that has had in doing business for a particular law firm. Doing the heavy lifting today are my fellow speakers. The first is Antonello Comiato. Antonella is the Chief Information Security Officer for the law firm of Hickey Smith, subject of today's discussion, and is also the Chief Technology Officer at Oreos. We also have Aaron Fritz, who is President and Founder of Inertia Legal. Inertia delivers and supports technology applications specifically for law firms. Those include document management, information security, and other areas. So, Aaron, why don't we get started with you? Can you give us an overview and your thoughts on the threat environment law firms are facing today? Absolutely, Steve, and thank you for the, the very warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be on the call with you uh, as well. But yes, um, let's, let's start and uh, let's consider here what is our reality today? And there are a number of sobering facts that we need to entertain. But let's establish our reality, and, and let's consider that over the course of the last 20 years, law firms have bit by bit become a favorite tar target of hackers. In fact, um, due to the consistently poor security standards that are often present in the legal sector, law firms have been titled, quote unquote, the soft underbelly of corporate data. Have to ask yourself a question here, if you're a hacker, why would you hack a Fortune 500 company directly when you can hack the firm hosting some of their most sensitive data? And obviously that firm, maybe 10 to 20 users in size, wouldn't have nearly the security controls of a, of a Fortune 500 company. So when we bring this back down, more focused on the law firm itself here, let's consider some of the very real risk vectors and results we're seeing. For instance, one third of law firms with 10 to 99 lawyers suffered a cyber breach in 2017. One third. 100% of the UK's top 100 firms suffered a cybersecurity incident in the last year. Again, 100%. These are huge numbers. Here's a very sobering one 60% of small businesses fold within six months of a cyber attack. The days of this having a nominal impact on operations and credibility are simply over. People understand the significance and the value of their own personal and business data, and a breach is simply something that a business cannot tolerate any further. Also, in May 2020, this, this year, ransomware hackers got into a New York City law firm 
and were demanding $42 million or they'd release confidential information across the internet. A couple more. 3.5 out of 10 ABA rankings are the average for cybersecurity procedures for small firms. Okay, so even internally, American Bar Association rankings, on average, rate firms 3.5 out of 10. That's in a self-assessment here. Lastly, ransomware attacks were up 25% overall in Q1 2020. And I want to note, that's before the pandemic hit and everybody started working remotely as per quarantine. And so we're in a very interesting time here. Uh, information, understand, information security is, uh, is more pressing than ever. Both business owners uh, and individuals are highly aware of the importance of their data and the, the efforts that are necessary to protect it. And hackers are very focused on acquiring that data. And so what do we do? And I would interject here that really a, a new paradigm is needed when it comes to securing law firm data and, and data across the board. But again, let's focus on law firms. You know, we need a standard to, in a general sense, you know, demand compliance with information security best practices. And it doesn't need to be aggressive, but it does need to be trustworthy and, and comprehensive in a general sense. Let's call it security by design as opposed to security by haphazard planning. I, I often have a, a, a visual that I would share here. When working with so many law firms and even medium-sized firms, they're well-intentioned when it comes to securing client data, but how do they take the standards and the ethical compliance that they know that they need to adhere to in, in serving a client and delivering legal services and translate that to cybersecurity? And I feel like so many owners uh, and managing partners of law firms are really in a tough spot. And, and they, they end up assessing their security but kind of sitting their IT guy down and kind of eyeballing him, looking him up and down and saying, or her up and down, right? And saying, am I secure? And they really don't know. And, and, and we need to bridge that gap. We need to take it from a gut level assessment to something empirical, something objective that, that really becomes an asset, uh, an asset that allows you to be confident in the way that your own law firm and client data is secured as well as something that you can broadcast. So that in, in a world where there is so much insecurity and data breaches happening with information, that you can broadcast, hey, we've made the right moves, we've done our due diligence, and we're even certified with a compliance standard that is, uh, that, that is truly confidence inspiring. So let me say, it's not just the law firm that needs to be secure as well. It, it's really the vendors that a law firm works with. And this goes back to some of the concepts that we're gonna talk about later here, is that when we're talking about security, it's not just about putting a firewall in place. It's not just about fancy new antivirus. It's really about how do we have a standard and a, and a general assessment that produces knowledge that we know that we are compliant, that we know we're secure. Um, furthermore, how do we really develop a culture of security so that we continually improve and evolve? And Antonella is going to talk about that in, in a terrific way in just a bit here. So I'll bring this home here and we'll turn it over to Antonella. Um, so one, one more point here before we kick over. I wanted, to, I wanted to mention that one of the vendors that law firms have used um, was hacked last year. It's the e-discovery vendor Epic. It's a very well-known name. But Epic was hacked this last year back in February. And the fallout was very substantial with that, as they hosted many legal cases, many e-discovery cases. And the fallout was that law firms couldn't access critical discovery information for the cases that they were litigating, um, in addition to the fact that sensitive client data um, was potentially released. And so we have a responsibility internally to the firm, as well as a responsibility to effectively assess the vendors that we're working with, and we need a standard to do that. So let's shift our focus over to an example of a law firm who, does, who has done an exceptional job in improving security and embracing security standards, not as a burden, but as an asset. Uh, they happen to be a client of ours, a fantastic one at that. They have World Docs in place, and that's very applicable here today, obviously. 
Um, and we have a long history of seeing their good decisions protect client data and grow their firm. So I'm happy to hand this over to Antonella Comiato. Um, Antonella, would you take it from here? Yes, thank you, Aaron. And certainly the cyber threats that you're describing, they are so challenging to law firms today, were just as strong and pervasive back in the late 2013 when the law firm of Vicki Smith was formed. And in that context, uh, security played and continues to play a specific role in the makeup of the firm. So, um, the law, Ike Smith was formed with the belief from the management team that they could provide a greater role and greater value to their clients by instituting a law firm that was process driven and technology enabled and where security played a key role uh, throughout. Often what we see is that security is an afterthought and uh, um, is a little bit, it's, it's basically brought to attention when an incident occurs, which is a little bit too late. And it's very counterproductive because it's much more costly and complex to re-engineer security into a process or into a system that was not built and designed with security from the onset. So um, the um, law firm of Vicky Smith took a much more proactive approach to security and they adopted this philosophy that Aaron was describing of security by design, where security is considered as an integral component of decision making from the very onset, from the very planning stages of making decision and across all the critical components such as people, processes, and technology, so hardware and software. In fact, that was one of the decisions and the reasons why uh, Hickey Smith chose uh, WorldDocs as a trusted vendor because they not only met their business requirements for a document management system, but they also met the security requirements that Hickey Smith had set for the onset of vendor selection because of the rich security features that are present in their solution. Today, Hickey Smith has grown to be a 50 plus per member law firm and it is present in nine states. So towards the end of 2014 and beginning of 2015, ISO 27001 was getting a lot of attention and spotlight at conferences and webinars and despite the interest of the management team at Ricky Smith to assess if it was going to be a um, strategic decision to apply for and go for an ISO 27001 certification. So we set out to do a, a, a discovery project to learn more about what ISO 27001 was all about and if it made sense for uh, such a, a young form. In a nutshell, ISO 20, 27001 is, uh, provides the information to implement and maintain an information security management system known as an ISMS to preserve the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information through a risk management process. So that by assessing risk, the um, firm can be, feel confident that they are managing security to a level that is acceptable to them. At the end of the discovery project, the, um, the uh, leadership team at Hickey Smith decided that becoming ISO 27001 certified firm would be a great competitive advantage and a strategic key differentiator. So they decided to move forward with the work to achieve certification. And they wanted to do it with a very comprehensive scope. So they wanted to include people, processes, and technology, very inclusive. They wanted to do it at a reasonable cost and within three months, which makes the whole project very challenging. So now why did they pick ISO 27001 as opposed to other uh, security frameworks such as SOC 2, NIST SP 853, NIST CSS, COVID-5. Uh, well, one of the main key differentiators was that ISO 27001 come with the ability of a, of a firm, of an organization to achieve a certification. And this certificate holds a lot of weight and great value to third parties and stakeholders such as clients, vendors, partners, and even when um, trying to negotiate a uh, premium with the cybersecurity insurance companies, 
or in case of a breach, being able to have a, a smaller fine uh, with the courts. Because by having an ISO 27001 certification, an organization certainly demonstrates that they put forward the due diligence required to protect information. A couple of additional key points for ISO 27001. The framework is designed to be applicable to all size of organization, doesn't matter if they're small, medium, or large, and all verticals. And one key differentiator certainly is that ISO 27001 addresses security for all form of information. While we see the other security frameworks very focused on IT specific concepts, ISO 27001 covers also information that is spoken and information that is written, which is really important. So how do we accomplish our goal to achieve certification within 90 days? During the, the planning phase, we obviously read the standard. It's not free. You can go to ISO.org and purchase it. It's relatively inexpensive. It's only about $130. And the old standard is uh, contained in a PDF of 23, 24 pages, so it's not very large. It's composed of two parts. The first part is all the management clauses that ISO 27001 prescribe in order to implement an information security management system. And the second part is what is referred to as Annex A, security controls. And this is a list of uh, of uh, controls that basically uh, ISO 27001 wants an organization to consider while they're assessing risk. So things such as do you have the proper procedure to handle onboarding of an employee that will touch confidential data, proper password policies, disaster recovery, things of that nature. The Annex A of ISO 27001 is derived from another standard. It's called ISO 27002. And it's also not free, costs around $180. And while not required to achieve certification in ISO 27001, it was certainly helpful to us because it did provide additional guidance in how to apply those um, security controls. So we purchased both standards, we studied them, and we learned them. And then we moved forward with a charter. The charter was extremely important at the very onset, not only because it announced to the entire firm that Hickey Smith was going to achieve ISO 27001 certification and what that was all about, but also because it showed that the project champion was the managing partner of the firm and the entire leadership. And that certainly set the tone at the top, from the top, that this was a very strategic and important project and helped with getting everybody on board. The next step was to select and implement the tool. During the discovery phase, we learned about organizations that tried to achieve ISO 27001 certification and failed. One of the reasons I reported is because they did not in they did not invest in a tool that would help them stay organized and guide them through the process. So we did not want to make the same mistake, and we uh, went ahead and implemented a tool at the very onset. And then we selected a registrar. There are a lot of accredited registrars in the United States for ISO 27001 and throughout the world, but there are not as many auditors that are accredited for ISO 27001 certifications. So Selecting a registrar from the very beginning will enable then you and enable us to schedule our audit at the time that we wanted to occur and we didn't have to um, have any delays for that. When we completed the planning phase and we moved into the execution phase, which basically all, it's all about uh, doing the work to comply with ISO 27001 standard. So certainly this is not everything that is required for compliance. I'm just going to talk about some of the main things that require that are required for compliance. And at the end of this presentation, we will provide a link to you where you can download a high-level ISO 27001 readiness checklist that you can use to assess your preparedness for an ISO 27001 compliance or certification. So one of the first things that we wanted to do wanted to do was understand who our main stakeholders were. So who were the interest party that could affect the implementation of an information security management system? And we wanted to understand their requirements from a contractual, 
legal and regulatory standpoint because they would all inform the makeup of our information security management system. And then we conducted this risk assessment, right? I mentioned at the beginning that ISO 27001 is all about preserving the confidentiality, integrity, availability of information through a risk management process. And so what we did, we first needed to understand what did we want to protect, right? So what are those assets that touch information in any way? And so again, it's not just IT, it's also people and processes. Once we had created an inventory of these assets, that's when we then assess those assets against the Annex A security controls or the ones that are listed in 27,002. And that helped us figure out which assets were most vulnerable for a possible uh, security threat. So a really good example, if you have confidential data that is only protected by user uh, logging in with a password, we know that that's very weak. So implementing a dual factor authentication, authentication solution would be like a preventive um, mitigation control that you can put in place to lower the risk. And so, so going, going through these processes enabled us to create a registry of the risks that we were concerned about and come up with a roadmap on how to address those risks. Um, and by the way, these tasks were not conducted serially. A lot of these activities were going on in parallel. And the next one was to institute an information security awareness program. So I cannot stress enough how security is not just an IT uh, worry. Every employee, every firm member has to be uh, asked to participate in protecting the security of the information of the organization. And so we um, updated the roles and responsibility of all firm members to include their role as it pertains to security. And then we had those conversations with them. And then we instituted an awareness program where we um, help firm members recognize a phishing email, suspicious activity, and most importantly, how, what to do in case that would happen. And how, do, how would they report an incident or the suspicion of an incident? Hickey Smith really took this one step further by actually implementing an information security awareness day. And so once a year, there will be a day that will be fully dedicated and every firm member participated in towards learning more about information security, understanding their role. The senior, the senior leadership had a very active role in, during that day. They participated in webinar. We had key speakers. And uh, it, it was very uh, strategic in helping change the mindset of the entire organization on how seriously the firm took security. Then we wanted to have a scorecard. Obviously, we needed to measure the success of our information security management system, and we instituted a scorecard for that purpose. And then we created an audit program so that we could confirm and verify that our information security management system performed as we designed it to perform and in compliance with ISO 27001. Finally, we had um, meetings with the leadership team. We had, we, the meetings were scheduled on a quarterly basis. Uh, different organizations have different cadence. They can do it monthly, they can do it semi-annually, but they must be conducted in order to be compliant with ISO 27001. And during those meetings, this is when the leadership team can understand the progress of an information security management system and if there are any uh, requirements for resources, training, and a status on how we're going with the implementation of the mitigation controls. Finally, we were ready for the audit. The audit is um, a two-step approach. There is stage one, which is all about um, making sure, being able to show to the auditor that we have created all the documentation and all the processes that are required for ISO 27001 compliance and that we um, are ready for stage two. The stage two audit is when the auditor will actually want to collect evidence that what we're saying that our information security management system is designed to do is actually doing and that it is in compliance with ISO 27001. And if we're able to demonstrate that to the auditor, this is how you uh, achieve the certificate, which Hickey Smith was able to achieve. I want to take a brief pause now and have a couple of poll questions 
So let's start with the first poll. Uh, what is your experience with ISO 27001? Uh, Antonella, I think we're having a little bit of an issue with the poll. You may just want to continue on without it. Okay, sure. And, and Antonella, this is Aaron here. I, I wanted to interject as if you could go back one slide here. Um, okay. There's so much to discuss on this page as looking at the process that you guys, that you all walk through here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. We're close. But there's so much that you all walk through this 90-day journey. And by the way, 90 days, fantastic. Uh, it sounds like this process is something that might take place over three years, not 90 days. But obviously, <laughs> that's not the case. Now, I'm going to say very talented people involved. Antonella, you, you drove this home for success. And, and of course, you had the buy-in of the managing partner as well. It's fundamental. It, it's, terrific, it's a terrific accomplishment. But I, I wanted to decompress this just for a moment because there's a lot of information coming at everybody right now. And, and one of the things that I would say, and I think this is something that gets lost in translation, you know, when, when we talk about security in a general sense, people know that that's not just computer based, right? There's all kinds of different security elements that we think about every day, everything from locking our car to locking our house, having a security system, um, trusting certain people with information, uh, not trusting other people with secrets, right? Uh, it, it's a very natural component of our lives to entertain security, but I, I think that there's a certain dissonance um, that is, is involved when we, when we step towards cybersecurity. And all of a sudden we think, oh, technology security is totally different. And, and obviously it's not, right? The concept of, of security is, is, is really universal. And it's important to back the conversation up when it comes to security away from technology only and firewalls and laptops and antivirus. That's really deep down some of the last components, just utilities that are, are, are put in place. And you have to rewind it all the way back towards, hey, what are our operations, right? And, and, what, and so much of what's reviewed in an ISO 27001 um, uh, audit like this, or really any effective standard out there, is a look at your firm's practices. And a, a reasonably well-run firm will be honing in on many, many strong practices that form the basis of good client information management as well as client security. And what ISO 27001 does is it says, okay, now let's add an element of security to make sure that we're holistically, you know, securing client data as well as the firm's data, right? It's not just about firewalls and routers, right? It, it's really about a comprehensive look at how operations secure client data. And like you said, build a culture of awareness for the ever growing um, threat vectors that we see in cybersecurity. So, so I just wanted to take that moment to try to get rid of the myth, so to say, to bust the myth of cybersecurity, you know, really being technology only. You have to back it up and put, you know, security understanding really into the fabric of your culture. And it's, while there's a lot to this, it's much easier than one might think because reasonable operations in a business or organization provide the foundation for a certification like this. We're just really knitting things together with that silver thread that ties together into something that's haphazardly planned or kind of grew organically into something that is, is really empirically um, approved and becomes an asset. So hopefully that makes a, makes a touch more sense. And again, congratulations, 90 days, fantastic work. Um, I'll be thinking about these points for quite some time and there's a lot of work that went into it. Back to you. Well, I that, yeah, and that, that's a great point that you're making, Aaron, and it's one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier that Hikismis chose ISO 27001 exactly for what you just described. ISO 27001 is not about cybersecurity, which tends to be more on the technology information system, like you said, firewalls and router. ISO 27001 covers uh, protection of all type of information, and that is a differentiator of ISO 27001 versus the other security frameworks that are out there, because it does provide and prescribe guidance on how to protect information also that is spoken, 
and that is written because you can certainly have massive breaches even if your IT securities are extremely robust and protected, but if you lay, leave laying around a hard copies that have uh, intellectual property or uh, important confidential information at a Starbucks, for example, and it has happened, uh, that is certainly just a serious uh, cyber uh, breach as it would be if it was related to IT systems. And the other important thing that ISO does, uh, ISO 27001 does is, this uh, importance of making sure that everybody in the organization understand their role as it pertains to security. And that's why we are required to update uh, uh, job descriptions and have these conversations with your, everybody in your organization so that they understand their role. So you can have that uh, culture shift to be much more security focused and it, did, it definitely did happen at Aki Smith. It, so, it really seems um, like there's so much I was going to say, it seems like there's so much compartmentalization when it comes to understanding security Absolutely. technology, right? And, and when Absolutely. we look at in a post-COVID world here and so much work, you know, remote work being performed, all of a sudden this culture of security is so much more important, right? Because we don't have it, information only at the office anymore. We have information at the office and at home and on the go. And, and, and it really requires a different perspective to look at, all the different ways that we pull that information and work with that information, with whether printed uh, or, or you know, via a, a mobile phone or computer, um, and things are constantly evolving, right? So, so we really have to have everybody thinking and on the same page uh, and, and destroy that compartmentalization. So that's, that's fantastic. Go ahead. Great point. Great point. So at the end of this project, uh, we obviously did a retrospect to um, understand what did we do well and what we would do differently if we had to do the project over. So some of these points is what we felt like we were, um, we, 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 did, we, picked, we took the correct approach. First and very important was the support from the top and being able to have the managing partner and the rest of the, rest of the um, leadership team at Ricky Smith support and champion this project definitely was one of the key contributor of the success. Uh, of achieving certification. We adopted a tool from the very beginning. We knew based on the research that we did during the discovery phase that uh, we need to be a lot of documentation that would be created, a lot of tasks, and we wanted to have a tool that would let, make sure that we could stay organized and guide us through the process. We didn't sweat each data, right? There's a lot of work to do. This was um, implementing the information security management system, and so, no one is expecting perfection, certainly the auditors are not expecting perfection. So once you feel like you have managed a particular task where you feel like, okay, this is good enough, move on, or you have the risk of getting into this paralysis analysis stage, which obviously will hinder you from um, making progress. It was also very helpful that I was dedicated to the project. It's not required by any means, but because this was, a, was needed to be done in a very short time frame. There was really not, not time to be working on other projects, so that definitely helped. Now, if we had to do this over, what we would we be doing differently? So you might recall that one of the um, requirements of the project was to keep the cost down. And so while we did engage a vendor, for a consultant, to help us through, to guide us through the process, we really uh, were cautious of using those hours to keep the, pro the cost down. And looking back, uh, we probably would have been best served to invest more in uh, consulting fees and not spend so much time doing trial and error and researching on our own. Also, as you go through the work of becoming compliant and preparing for the certification on ISO 27001, you will be building a very rich library of documents such as policies, processes, procedures, checklists, plans. We wrote all of them from scratch. Uh, that was that took several weeks, and uh, being able to leverage some libraries that um, you can purchase that provide a very robust baseline to start from, and just adapt that to meet the um, uh, objectives of Hickey Smith would have been um, would have been a smart thing to do, and certainly saved a lot of time. And we engage a vendor, a, a consultant probably, and ask their uh, feedback about what the implementation team makeup needed to be. 
uh, they probably would have advised me that I needed some help on the sense of there's gonna be a lot of busy work, right? In the middle of the project, I realized that there were a lot of uh, uh, follow-up moments where I, we needed to follow up with the vendors, we needed to follow up with the uh, firm members to make sure they were on track with their training, with the review of the policies, and that work took a lot of time. And so uh, in the middle of it, I asked um, support from the leadership team to get a couple of resources allocated to the project to help me with those uh, touch points, and I, um, if I could do it Again, I will uh, firm up the resources at the beginning of the project, so uh, they would already be part of the team. Lastly, I think we did a pretty good job at communicating with the leadership team. We probably could have done a better job communicating with the rest of the organization. Of course, time was at an essence, but we could have probably through uh, newsletters or blogs or maybe monthly meetings kept the rest of the organization informed on how we were progressing toward achieving the certification. There were absolutely strong value that Hickey Smith achieved from uh, uh, gaining the ISO 27001 certification. Uh, certainly the confidence of understanding how the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the client's firm, uh, of the firm's clients and of the firm itself uh, sort of information is protected uh, was uh, a huge benefit. Uh, having confidence in how to react should an incident arise, uh, that was also a great uh, benefit of getting the, the uh, compliance and certification to ISO 27001. We developed a lot of uh, uh, contingency plans such as incident response, disaster recovery, business continuity, and then we did a lot of tabletop exercises to make sure that the teams that are involved would know how to react if the incident was to uh, really materialize. And then there was this culture switch that Aaron was describing and I described that as we were going through this process, there was really buy-in from the entire organization, not just at the top, of the importance of security, and the entire firm really become much more security focused. Another point is vendors. Vendors and suppliers are critical in an information security program, right? Because an organization can be extremely diligent in implementing a robust set of controls to protect their uh, the data, but if they don't hold their suppliers and vendors at the same standard and check the robustness and posture of their, of their uh, information security program, they're at very high risk of an incident or a breach. And again, this is another reason why uh, Vicky Smith felt comfortable choosing World Docs and uh, Inertial Legal because of the attention and focus that they also give to information security. A couple of additional bonus points. Uh, it became very uh, almost transparent for Vicky Smith to answer those uh, information security assessments that were being sent by client and potential clients because uh, of all the work that was done already for information for ISO 27001 uh, compliance. I remember receiving an 18 pages information security assessment that a potential client sent to Ike Smith, and it was very simple to answer those questions, yes, because there were a lot about what we did for ISO 27001. It is also a great springboard for privacy. Law firms today need to meet demands with compliance with privacy, such as the California Consumer Privacy Act, the SHIELD Act in New York, all the different privacy laws are coming out in the different states and even in the EU with GDPR. And what ISO did about a year ago, they published a new standard called ISO 27701, and it basically builds in top of 27001 and provides the ability to demonstrate due diligence towards uh, how an organization handles PII or personally identifiable information towards protecting privacy. And so this was kind of ISO response for organization to be able to say that we're uh, applying the due diligence to compliance to privacy regulations such as GDPR by achieving an ISO 27701 certification. And this is a huge point, Antonella. Um, because yeah. there are so many security standards out there, and, and we see so many of our clients 
receiving security audits from different vendors, be it hospitals they work with or banks they work with or whatever it might be. And everybody has a different standard. And that can be a, a, a huge undertaking to audit again and again and again your operations and security. When wouldn't it be better just to hand them, hey, here's our ISO 27001 certification with maybe a, you know, a few more pieces of information necessary for them. But it's that standardization, uh, so you don't have to worry about what new compliance standard is going to be released. Well, no, you, you, you've already started with the most accepted you know, um, standard out there. It gives you a footing so you don't have to worry about having to respond to all that. You just charge forward. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I think it's, it's definitely worth it to mention that so even though we did not do a tabletop earlier on uh, about what would, we, what would be his mix to respond in case of a pandemic, we didn't foresee a pandemic coming. Um, it is missed because of all the uh, controls that they put in place from a security perspective. When the stay at home order came, it was pretty non-eventful for it is missed when the entire firm member had, were asked to work from home. It, it, there was pretty much no disruption to the operation of the law firm. And also the managing partner of the firm, uh, David Hickey, was recognized as a cybersecurity and data privacy trailblazer by the National Journal Law Journal um, after Ike Smith got the, uh, achieved the certification in 2015, which is a pretty, um, a pretty uh, worthy accomplishment for such a, long, uh, such a young law firm at the time. I wanted to uh, make a couple of points about adopting a tool. Um, I mentioned it throughout the presentation that we really felt that was one of the key factors in helping us be successful into achieving the certification within a 90-day time frame. But as I was using the tool, I realized that certain parts of uh, the components of ISO 27001 were handled by the tool, while others were missing. And as I got to know auditors, I asked these ISO 27001 auditors if they could recommend a tool that would help us, uh, um, you know, in, in a more inclusive way with uh, maintaining an ISO 27001 certification and also implementing the information security management system. And the feedback that I got from all three of them at different times was that while they see a lot of tools, they have yet they had yet to see a tool that really managed all of the components that are required for an ISO 27001 compliance and for that matter for the implementation on information security program so we talked about risk management we talked about awareness we talked about hr components and um and so on and the scorecarding and information and the meetings with the management team and so at that point, we then decided to create our own tool that actually would be inclusive of all these components that are strategic for the, success, the successful implementation of the security program. And we call that on track just because the, design, the, the idea is that this tool will keep us on track with compliance and will guide us through the process. And see, is there anything else you want to add about on track? Yeah, I was about to interject. I, I think this is an important point to emphasize. And, you know, just like a law firm would not consider running their financials without an accounting system, the firms really need to run their information security program with an information security management system. And now, obviously, we are, you know, we built on track specifically based on our experience with a law firm and we're quite partial to it. But I think any firm that is examining an ISMS needs to think about some attributes, and, and we've listed a few here. I mean, when you're looking at a platform, please make sure it's customizable. Every firm is different. Practice areas, needs, the, the gaps and, and risks in the firm are different. You need, a, you need a, um, an ISMS, a platform that is customizable to you. You want it to simplify compliance management. Uh, that's really the idea of a tool. You want it to ultimately save more hours than it consumes, um, and you want something that makes the process simple and robust, not complex and fragile. So please consider that. Um, also take a look at a tool that manages multiple frameworks and standards. So obviously we've spent a lot of time talking about ISO 27001, but Antonella, you noted several times, and you too, Aaron, that there are more than one standards out there. There's NIST standards, there are other standards. Um, you wanna make sure that whatever 
um, platform you get is facile enough to to multi to to handle a few of those. Um, I would suggest we would suggest that, that the tool come with a full library of policies out of the box. Now you may have policies. You may be able to implement those and ingest those into the tool, but the fact of the matter is, is that on the road to um, security maturity, you're going to need, probably going to need, I should say, a lot of policies. And the fact that they have come already designated, customizable, out of the box is a, is a, is a very large time saving and education savings as you're, as you're going forward. Um, you want it to provide great reporting not only to auditors, but to your managers and stakeholders, so you can show them the value of the implemented um, uh, information security program, as well as vendors, too. When those large Fortune 500 companies start asking, what is your information security program? You want a platform that's going to be able to respond to those requests. And then finally, cost effective. Geez, you can spend a lot of money on this, but uh, platforms don't have to be uh, um, costly to to help you manage it. And you know, for everyone's going to ask, how much does something like this cost? And you know, really, for the less the, for the cost of one summer associate, um, you can have a robust information security platform that saves you far in excess of the, the in terms of time of the cost of of the platform itself. So maybe if we can summarize this real quick. Uh, yes. So um, thank you, uh, Aaron and Antonella, for, for that. And I think that in, to summarize the program that we've had or the, uh, that we've just given, uh, there's six things that we hope the audience takes away from it. One is here, uh, implemented. you want an implemented compliance program. So you don't want anything ad hoc. Ad hoc just means that there are going to be gaps, and those are gaps that a hacker can drive a truck through. So if you're going to do it, make sure that it's a, a program, it's consistent, it's formal, it's written down. Uh, number two, we clearly suggest it based on a recognized framework or standard. You don't have to necessarily achieve ISO 27001 certification to get the benefits. Or if you're going to a, um, a, sort of, uh, a, um, a standard or a framework that is not certifiable like NIST, what it does do, though, is it gives you a best practices um, program for you to achieve for you to achieve your compliance. So, basing whatever you do on a recognized framework and standard is important. Number three is we talk about thoughtful controls to mitigate um, remote workforce risk, but thoughtful controls really means that every Every firm is different. The risks that you face, uh, each uh, each firm faces, are going to be different, and that you should triage those risk, identify the gaps, address the big gaps and the high risks first, so you can take a very so you can get those out of the way and and proceed forward. And Aaron, I know you have a few thoughts on this as well. Yeah, and, and what I wanted to mention was that we have uh, utilities and and different processes that we can use to identify, you know, what are the dif different risk factors? Everything's from what is the mobile phone to where is data located? Um, and and this, this conversation is a, is a robust one, uh, to use a, an overly used tech term, quite frankly. Uh, but, uh, but it's one that's really important, you know, because identifying risk factors is not as simple as hardware and software. We use many solutions nowadays uh, as a service type items. And so a very common one is exchange online uh, through Office 365, right? That is a, a service that many, many law firms use to host their uh, email information now instead of putting it on their own servers. And so the reason I say this is as opposed to thinking hardware and software, we really need to think hardware, software, and solutions, and, and, and we can create um, a whole understanding, a topology of what, you know, those uh, remote workforce risk, risk factors are, as well as uh, where is your data? And, and we can help you establish a very clear understanding that would then feed into this process, of course. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, also, tools to manage and validate compliance, just mentioned earlier on track or any ISMS that you could 
uh, that a firm could use would really, really help in, in um, uh, achieving security maturity. Uh, whatever you do, you should offer proof for your clients, partners, or your other stakeholders that it is working and the value that it's derived. And then finally, um, you know, security, security uh, maturity is not a one and done. It's a continuous process. It's a journey. Um, the threat landscape of the organization changes con constantly. Um, where you have your assets, where you hold your information, the type of information, everything is so dynamic that it is something that you have to address on a regular basis. So if you walk out with nothing other than, than these, we hope that you take these to heart as you go forward in your journey to information um, security maturity. And I think we mentioned earlier on, um, here is the link to the ISO 27001 readiness assessment. Please feel free to jot this down. Obviously, you'll get a copy of the, the um, slide deck if you'd like, but um, if you want to jot it down real quick, um, this will give you an idea on how ready you are. And uh, that pretty much wraps up the formal part. Um, I see we do have a couple of questions. Um, if we could take those on, Let me, are we are we ready, panelists? Are we ready for a question or two before we wrap up? Hello, do we have time? Uh, yes, we do have time for a few questions. Um, sure, sure. Let me let me get the first question out there. Um, uh, Antonella, this is for you. You know, obviously we talked about the ninety days, but the question is, what's a reasonable time period for implementing a standard like ISO twenty seven thousand and one? It really depends, right? It depends on the scope of the certification. The larger the scope, obviously, the more time it's going to take. The maturity of the organization is also a factor. Hickey Smith was a startup law firm, so a lot of uh, the processes uh, were actually uh, being built as part of the ISO 27001 um, effort. If the company, if the organization, the law firm is already mature, they already have some type of security program in place, that would, of course, help it go uh, more expeditiously. Uh, my suggestion would be to uh, go ahead and uh, fill out this ISO 27001 audit readiness checklist that we're providing, and then really do a quick discovery pro project, right? Because that would really help identify what areas need to be built, either from scratch or modified to be in compliance with the standard. And then after that, you can really then have a pretty good idea of what the effort will entail. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, one, one, the next question again, um, uh, actually, Aaron and Antonella, you could probably, um, either of you can address this, but Antonella first, um, I'm sure it's on the mind of a lot of our, our law firm security people and information, um, folk, uh, information technology folks. Uh, how did you get buy-in from the attorneys? Well, like I mentioned, I think a couple of times, what made it so successful was the fact that the leadership team at Ike Smith was so engaged and so strongly believe about the importance of being proactive on managing information security. And so from the very onset, the charter announced that the project was sponsored by the managing partner and the leadership team. And doing things like dedicating an entire day, right, on information security awareness where the leadership team would sprinkle in webinars and, and calls and uh, sessions really helped with getting everyone, attorney, case assistant, paralegal, everyone at the firm engaged, being part of this effort. And like I said, it truly did change the culture set to be a lot more uh, security focused. So uh, Antonella, this is Rebecca from WorldDocs. Um, Having spent much of my career working in law firms, uh, even though it sounds like you had quite a bit of buy-in, did you have anybody that, that was a little bit harder to sell on this? And if so, how did you, how did you bring them on board? Great question. So um, we didn't necessarily have people that didn't buy in, but maybe they were taking it not as seriously as we needed them to because of the fact that we were on such a tight, timeline. 
And so one of the first steps that we did uh, that I talked about earlier was identifying the key stakeholders, right? So these are all of the uh, individuals that have a, a say into your information security management system that you're putting in place. And as you're going through that process of identifying these individuals, you're talking to them and you're assessing how engaged they are or they're going to be. And so it took a couple of uh, hand holding on some of them to actually uh, meet the timelines we had uh, set forth for them of completing training, reviewing policies. And one thing that, um, so internally it was man managed that way, but one um, I think interesting part is that one of our vendors uh, was not responding to our inquiries about uh, reviewing the Hickismith information security pro um, policy and some other uh, activities that we were asking them to entertain. And I notified the managing partner and within the, within the matter of 30 minutes, the managing partner wanted to know the contact information of this vendor. He called this vendor himself and said, either you respond because for us security is important, you are not taking security important and we do not want to have a relationship with suppliers that don't. So either you're, you're responding today or we're gonna find another vendor. And that was, that was incredible. I mean, it, they, 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 it's huge, a huge uh, support from the top. Yeah, that's, you know, that definitely makes a difference. Well, yeah. you know, it's, it's attorneys take attorney-client privilege extremely seriously. Protecting client data is the electronic version of that commitment to attorney-client privilege. So it is, it, it is critically important that attorneys um, look at that in that manner and take it with the, with the commencement round of seriousness. Because if a hacker gets the uh, data that they have on their clients, it's just as, as bad as if they stood on the, you know, corner of, of uh, 36th and Lex and screamed it out all, you know, screamed out the information. It's just, they need to do that. Um, uh, we have another question, um, Aaron. Um, we heard about um, the recommendations for a platform. Do you have some recommendations for a service provider to help us uh, improve our security posture? Or what would you look for? Well, as, a, as a matter of fact, I do, Steve. And obviously, uh, we could be of assistance on that front. No, really, I, I'm, I'm jesting here. Uh, but, I, but I do mean that, that we would be happy to help walk down that road. And, and there are plenty of, of, of different outfits uh, from managed service providers uh, to dedicated security consultants that can help you assess um, everything from, like we stated before, you know, your phones to your computers to the services that you provide to even um, how do your, your normal workflows overlap with, with cybersecurity and how do we knit that information together. And so, but let me be clear that Inertia Legal would um, love to work with you. Uh, give us a call. We can uh, advise you initially and, and, and provide services direct or steer you towards the right person uh, to provide those services. And of course, uh, we love working with Oreos. OnTrack is a phenomenal product. It knits together so many disparate I ideas and, and different pieces of information that are necessary to delivering um, you know, a, a compliance standard like this or achieving a compliance standard. It makes it so easy. So please give us a call. Happy to guide you through it. And, and I wanted to, to reference back to the prior question and just state something that, you know, after my 15 years here, that's not forever in a day, but it's a good while working with lawyers and, and, and legal technology. I'll say that as we explain legal technology or technology concepts to managing partners and, and law firms, Steve, what you said, the whole concept of attorney-client privilege data and, and how seriously they take that, that's so true. And sometimes from the the low scores we see in legal technology and you know like i said i even led off with legal tech or not legal technology but law firms have become the soft underbelly of corporate data that's that's a that's a that's a pretty heavy term right there right kind of funny but whoa one of the things i would say is that it's not that there's apathy in the legal industry regarding security i really have to say that there's there's really a, um, an education that's necessary and there's a lack of information or there's a lack of knitting information together. And so when a, when a managing partner or, or a, an attorney understands that their commitment to attorney-client privileged data and how serious they take that when they're working with the client extends in cybersecurity on these two or three very clear fronts 
and, and, and they're not disparate concepts with dissonance in between them, but they're, they're unified, all of a sudden it makes loads of sense, right? And all of a sudden that, that unity informs the way that they roll out a culture of security and they roll out um, uh, or the way that they acquire technology and whatnot. And so we love this idea. And, and again, the more that that dissonance is destroyed and, and that lawyers understand how attorney-client privilege data extends into cybersecurity, the more competent decision-making we see on the security front, uh, and, and, and really the more action we see towards these compliance standards and treating uh, compliance like this, as, as an, again, as an asset, not as a burden, and something to be proud of and display to clients. So uh, it's a great journey. Thank you for the question. Uh, hello, I think we've reached the top of our hour. Can I pass it back to you? Yeah. And, and if there are any, I'm sure. you have have procedures. Well, if there are we, any other questions? Yeah, actually, um, just a real quick question. Um, how can um, people find out more about the OnTrack platform, and and uh, what is the cost? Is the, what can they? Who can they call for that? And do you have any quick info for that? Sure, sure. Um, uh, they can certainly contact me. You can see the um, the contact information on the on the screen there. They could reach out if they want um, additional services to Aaron as well too. He is uh, up on the on the product either way. Uh, in terms of cost, as I mentioned, um, it really uh, it depends on a lot of different things, but it's probably far less than the cost of a minimum wage employee for the your average firm. Um, there's usually a startup cost to get things uh, up and running, but in terms of its maintenance cost, um, it is actually very, very reasonable and provides a great return in terms of not only reducing the resources required to maintain a robust security program, but also, as uh, Antonella mentioned early on, the soft return of of protecting data and, and uh, minimizing any intrusion, as well as, uh, God forbid, there's a breach and fines, and and then reducing the uh, the cost of cyber secure uh, cyber insurance as well too. Um, but we can customize something for um, for any firm uh, or any organization that would like to have a chat. More than happy to do that. Great. That sounds wonderful. Um, it, any of anybody else um, have a um, anything you would like to add? Okay. Then uh, then uh, I think we'll uh, get to the end of today's webinar. Thank you, uh, Antonella, Steve, and Aaron for doing the webinar with us today. Um, as mentioned, we are going to post a recording of this webinar, so anyone unable to attend today, they still have a chance to see it. And to those of you who were able to join us today, thank you very much. And we hope uh, you will all join us again soon for another presentation in our webinar technology series. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank, thank you. you.